I want to talk about Faraday cages, because there is a lot of bad information out there about Faraday cages. On the off chance you don't know what one is, for our purposes it's a metal enclosure that protects sensitive electronics from something like an EMP. So first of all, the frequencies that you're able to block are determined by the size of the holes in your mesh. If you make it out of solid plates, then this is only an issue if you have gaps or holes in the welding, but bear with me. The holes have to be, at most, half the wavelength of the frequency that you're trying to block. So let's say you're trying to block 3 GHz Wi-Fi. That's a convenient number because the wavelength of that is almost exactly 10 centimeters. You take the speed of light in meters divided by the frequency in hertz, so 3 GHz is 3 billion hertz, and that gives you the wavelength in meters. So to block that, the holes in your mesh would have to be no bigger than 5 centimeters, in width, not height. So how big do the holes have to be to block an EMP? A nuclear EMP comes in three waves, E1, E2, and E3. The E1 component is about 50,000 volts per meter, or 6.6 .6 megawatts per square meter, but it only lasts for a few nanoseconds. It's a very quick pulse. The E2 component is similar to the EMP created by a bolt of lightning, and the E3 component is almost identical to a solar flare. Basically, the nuke bends the Earth's magnetic field in the same way that a CME crashing into it does, and that induces currents on the ground. E1 is the highest frequency, so in terms of shielding, that's the only one we really need to look at. The most that we've seen in nuclear testing is into the hundreds of megahertz, though there are some dedicated EMP devices that can get into the gigahertz range. So a 5 centimeter gap example could potentially handle most EMPs. Now, there are some people on the net saying that you have to have sub-nanometer gaps to block an EMP. The mistake they made is they used the wavelength of gamma rays in the equation. Gamma rays are not an EMP. The E1 component is created by gamma rays knocking electrons out of the air, which then spiral around the Earth's field lines via the Compton effect, but the gamma rays themselves are not part of the EMP and you cannot block them with a Faraday cage. To do that, you would need radiation shielding, like heavy lead plates. So that's how you determine what frequencies your cage can block. How much of those frequencies it blocks is based on a combination of the aperture size and the waveguide length, or, in practical terms, the size of the holes and how thick the material is. What it's made of is a factor too, but apparently for our purposes it's negligible. As long as it's conductive enough it should be fine. I couldn't find anything more specific than that. So here's the formula. It doesn't give you the exact protection, it's an approximation for practical purposes. But it took me three days to find, so I'm going to walk you through this. It's slightly different for rectangular holes versus circular ones, so we'll go with rectangular holes, and we'll stick with our original example of 5 cm gaps, which gives us a cutoff frequency of 3 GHz, or f of c in the formula. F is the frequency that's actually hitting you, so let's go with 700 MHz. That's a reasonable peak for a nuclear E1. D is the thickness, we'll go with half a centimeter. A is the width of the biggest hole, plug it all in, and you get about 2.63 decibels of protection from that frequency, which is abysmal. Now, why is this so terrible? If you've searched this before, you've probably seen a rule of thumb that your holes should be one-tenth the size of the wavelength you're trying to block. The cutoff frequency is one-half, but the smaller the holes, the less thick the material has to be to give you good blocking. So, to keep the numbers even, rather than one-tenth of 700 megahertz, I'm just going to change the size of the holes to one centimeter, which changes the cutoff frequency to almost exactly 15 gigahertz. And that ups our protection to 13.49 decibels, which is much better, but still not great. You're going to want to bring that hole size down to a millimeter to get really good results, which is probably the biggest size hole you'll find on most professional products. Decibels are a logarithmic scale. They're also just a way of representing a ratio, or in other words, a percentage. So 20 decibel protection would be filtering out 90% of the waves coming in. 40 decibels would be 99%, etc. To give you some reference, the International Electrotechnical Commission recommends at least 30 decibels of protection up to 10 gigahertz. And military level 4 EMP protection, MIL standard 188-125-1, recommends 80 decibels up to 10 gigahertz, which is probably overkill. So if you're worried about an EMP attack and you want to make your own Faraday cage to save money, that's what you're aiming for. The only other thing to keep in mind is that the material has to be continuous. So if there's any kind of door or lid, make sure you have metal touching metal all the way around. No gaps. And if you're going to spend any significant amount of money on this, just get something that's certified mill spec. Don't waste your time on cheap crap. If you're going to bother spending money, get something that you know works because you can't test it yourself. Sticking a Wi-Fi router or a cell phone in the cage is not going to tell you whether or not it's going to filter out enough of 50,000 volts per meter to prevent damage. Now, having made that public service announcement, we have not been talking about an EMP this whole time. As discussed in part 3 of my Fatima Theory series, we are talking about a Carrington level CME and a Micronova. And the good news is, you do not need a Faraday cage to protect against a Carrington level solar storm. Again, you only get the E3 component from a solar storm. During Soviet nuclear testing, they measured the E3 component at about 85 volts per kilometer. Scaling that to lower latitudes, they think it could get up to about 102 volts per kilometer. 
According to this NOAA presentation from 2011, the largest solar storm on record only produced 20 volts per kilometer. The Carrington event would likely be bigger, but not by much. And that's absolutely nothing, because that's per kilometer. Per inch, it's only 0.002 volts. There's not going to be significant attenuation in the tiny wires in your appliances. And we know this anecdotally as well as mathematically. Because remember, during the Carrington event, it was only the miles-long telegraph wires that caused a problem. There were no stories of people getting shocked on silverware or hand tools, long metal poles, nails in wooden structures, long railings not grounded by a conductor. If there was no significant current in metal objects of this size, then the tiny wires and circuitry in your cell phone or your refrigerator won't be a problem either. The only thing that might be an issue would be modern CPUs, because they're extremely sensitive to even tiny bits of current in the wrong place. But even in that case, from what I'm reading, nobody really expects it to be an issue. So in 2029, if you get word that the big one is coming, just unplug everything, and maybe someday you'll have power again to use it all. On that note, here's the schematic of a bicycle generator I made, just in case that saves somebody some work. Now, the Micronova is a completely different animal. It's possible that the Nova Flash, the relativistic particles, might actually create something similar to the E1 component of a nuclear EMP. So all of that previous math might apply. But the real problem would be the massive E3 component, the induced current. Like I said before, that's created by bending the Earth's field. It's the magnetic flux, the changing of the field that we're in, that induces the current through Faraday's law. During the Soviet nuclear testing, they saw the field change about two or 3,000 nanoteslas per minute, ignoring that 17,000 anomaly. The 1921 railroad storm was estimated to be about 5,000 nanoteslas per minute, which again is about in the same ballpark as the Carrington event. And Ben Davidson of Suspicious Observers expects the Nova to be somewhere between one and three orders of magnitude stronger than that. In terms of energy, not the effect it would have on the field. Now, I could try to scale that up, but the thing is, when the Nova hits, the Earth's magnetic field is probably going to be down to about 10 or 20 percent. We think it's currently at about 85 percent, relative to 1840. That's when we first started measuring it. In 2020, it looks like the average field strength was about 45,000 nanoteslas. So if that's 85, then 10 percent would be about 5,300 nanoteslas. Now, the magnetic flux we're measuring on the ground is not the same thing as how much the CME is weakening the planet's magnetic field. That's a different measurement called the Disturbance Storm Time Index. But either way, when the Nova hits, that field is going to go to zero pretty quickly. And I don't know how that affects the math. Does the field reverse and we start counting up? Does the magnetic flux hit zero and we just kind of hover there? Or does this gigantic cloud of stuff from the sun just come crashing to the ground with no resistance other than the atmosphere, bringing its own chaotic magnetic fields with it? So I have no idea what that would do to the amount of current it's inducing. And I'd really like to be able to put a ceiling on that in terms of amperage, so that I could tell you what kind of a Faraday cage you would need. Because there is a window where the current would be high enough that you need one, and low enough that it doesn't melt the cage. Which is an idea Ben has tossed around a couple of times. Where there's so much current that even loose change in your pocket is melting. Of course, if you get mass animal navigation chaos across the globe in one day, auroras at the equator, and melting change in your pocket, maybe you don't need space weather to tell you what's happening with Earth's magnetism. The E3 is supposedly subhertz, so the size of the holes would not be an issue. I mean, at those frequencies, you could theoretically use the steel frame of a building and it should work. We could use the wire ampacity rating as a guide. For example, 600 gauge copper wire is about a foot thick and is rated to handle currents up to 420 amps. An average bolt of lightning is about 30,000 amps. But if we were in a magnetic field that was inducing that kind of current in something like a one meter cube Faraday box, then I'm pretty sure the iron in our blood would start running a current and we'd all die. So I definitely think that's a ceiling, but it's not really a helpful one. And before you make the same mistake I did, yes, lightning rods use one gauge wire, but the current is only running through them for a very, very brief period of time. And you do have to replace them after a certain number of strikes because they do deteriorate. If you ran that kind of current through it continuously, it would probably vaporize. So let's just ignore the effects of the field collapsing and try to ballpark this. We'll say the flux is going to be 5 million nanoteslas. That's three orders of magnitude higher than the 1921 railroad storm. We'll say our Faraday cage is a one meter cube wire frame box made out of 10 gauge copper wire. That's pretty middle of the road. I've got some 10 gauge lying around. Now, I think this is how you apply Faraday's law. The box would effectively be two square coils perpendicular to the field lines. 5 million nanoteslas would be the delta of the B field, and the delta T would be 60 seconds. Punch that in to get the voltage, and then use Ohm's law to convert it to amps. And only two sides are perpendicular to the field lines in any given orientation, but the current would flow through the whole thing, so that's 12 meters total of wire. I might be doing that wrong, but the difference is negligible. And it comes out to 40 microamps. That's three zeros away from the current in the neurons in your brain. It's absolutely nothing. 
you wouldn't even need a Faraday cage, except, again, maybe for modern CPUs. But maybe adding three orders of magnitude to the flux is the wrong way to do this, so let's reverse the formula. How much of a field change would we need to exceed the ampacity rating on 10 gauge wire? That's 30 amps, so we plug that in and we get... <laughs> 36 Teslas? That's 36 trillion nanoteslas. And remember, that's per minute. That's just the rate that it's changing. If that went on for 10 minutes, which is entirely reasonable given how long the Carrington event went on, that would be over 300 Teslas. Do you have any idea what that would do? No, neither do I. Let's look it up. So, you can levitate a frog with 16 Teslas. Frogs are not usually what you would consider to be magnetic, but everything is a little magnetic. It's called diamagnetism. In a strong enough magnetic field, your electrons actually orient themselves in such a way that their orbit around the nucleus creates a magnetic field, which repels from the strong field. So everything that wasn't paramagnetic or ferromagnetic would be getting pressed down by the field of the nova cloud. Imagine it would feel like gravity being turned up. Until it came down to the ground and enveloped you, then it would probably feel like a high-pressure environment. I don't know at what point that causes you to pass out or have a heart attack, but that would be an issue. But let's have some real fun. What do you think a field that strong would do to something that's traditionally ferromagnetic, like the Eiffel Tower? Now, this math is going to be wrong. From what I found, there is no simple formula for calculating the pull between a magnetic field and a piece of metal. I found two that claim to be rough approximations, but they're more intended for something like the lifting force that a bar magnet that's stuck to something could handle. So don't take these numbers too seriously. But assuming a 36 tesla field, fully enveloping the 6200 square meters of surface area of the tower, which is made of wrought iron, which we'll say has a relative permeability of about 5,000. One formula says it's 65,000 tons of force, and the other one says it's 330 million tons of force. Bit of a spread there, but the Eiffel Tower only weighs 10,000 tons, so if that is even remotely in the right ballpark, then it would get ripped out of the ground and flung into the stratosphere. I mean, picture this. Cars, buildings, natural gas pipelines, railroad tracks, bridges, aircraft carriers, all flying into the sky, being twisted into pretzels or crushed into a ball. Yes, I know that's the ending of Akira. Induced current would not even be a consideration. I mean, forget crustal displacement. There's enough magnetic material in the crust that chunks of continents might start levitating. Just to be fair, I tried using 20 gauge wire instead, and that only requires about two Teslas to exceed the ampacity rating, which is not enough to lift the Eiffel Tower. But again, that's per minute. So if it went on for 10 minutes, then we would be back into levitating frog territory. Also, this example was two perfect square loops with the field lines exactly perpendicular to them. Inducing this current in a straight wire or a metal hand tool would require an even stronger field. So, uh, as entertaining as it is to imagine real-life anime, that's not a thing that's going to happen. Prophecy aside, even one Tesla is nine orders of magnitude beyond anything we've ever seen, and that just doesn't seem realistic. I don't know if Ben was just spitballing with that loose change melting in your pocket idea, or if I'm just doing this wrong, which wouldn't surprise me. If anyone out there is better at electrical physics and caught a mistake, by all means point it out. But based on this, I would say either don't bother with a Faraday cage, or if you want to be safe, get something that can handle the E1 component of an EMP. That should be enough. But if you really want to be extra safe, you can nest it inside of something thicker, like a garbage can or a steel drum, or our example 10-gauge wireframe box if you have that lying around. Remember to put something in it that can actually generate power. I would go with a bicycle generator because you can operate that quietly alone in a dark room, whereas things like solar panels, windmills, and water wheels tend to be very noticeable from far away by people you don't want noticing them and combustion engines are very loud. The downside is that with a bicycle you're converting food into electricity, but you're not going to need a whole lot of electricity. Use DC appliances where possible, because converting to AC is inefficient, and an inverter is a point of failure. Even a good one will probably only last you 10 years. Here ends my 13-minute rant on Faraday cages.